Okay, first question someone asked. Um, obviously, I'm not Betty. <laughs> Betty's right there. So uh, it's, uh, it's a misprint. And uh, today's session, unlike Sunday, is more kind of a short and sweet, quick examples with root cause, and then we'll move on. Kind of, I, I kind of call it hit and run uh, protocol analysis. The, um, Janice is going to upload all of our presentation PowerPoint. I stopped embedding PCAP files into PowerPoints because uh, they convert it to PDF, and then you know, I get 50 emails saying, I click on the icon, but it's not downloading, and where are the PCAP files? So now I'll just give you the link. Um, and just go there and download this. There's two zip files, one for Sunday session and one for this session, which will go up tonight. All right. Um, so most of you already know me. I used to do routing and switching at Citigroup. So that meant that my play playing field was very large. And so you got to see some pretty unique stuff that you may not normally see. And that's what I share with you guys. Okay. So the first example, um, failure to download. This one was interesting because I got snagged into it because I happened to be walking by a colleague of mine and like an idiot I said, hey, what are you looking at? Right, because you know, she had uh, Ethereal on at the time. And uh, so every time I see Ethereal, like, you know, like do -do 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 -do, I, I gravitate towards it because it's a passion of mine. So here's a scenario, okay? Thousand branches, thousand Citibank branches that you guys know, the brick and mortar branch. Uh, every night, the mainframe downloads the Oracle update to every branch because that's your home branch and your records are kept in a database uh, so that, for example, when you go to a branch and you put in your ATM card, it checks the local database to see if you're a customer because it's faster. And if not, uh, well, anyway, we're not, we don't need to get into all the details because then you'll hack it. And, and, uh, but, so there are some SLAs involved with using an ATM card, so there's a lot of benefits to having a local copy of the database. But of course, the ledgers and balance and everything has to be updated. Here's the problem. We implemented router-based IPsec. Uh, this was still hub-and-spoke type environment. And um, randomly, intermittently, all these branches failed to get the Oracle database. Every night, it was some other branch. It was never the same two branch. Sometimes it was, there was a repeat. But for the most part, completely random, mainframe could not update the database. Okay? So there are no coincidences in life. The last change that we made was the IPsec. So chances are it has to do with IPsec, right? Logical conclusion. So for those of you that don't know, router-based encryption, all it means is you open up a tunnel, essentially. Uh, in this case, it was actually a GRE tunnel because it turns out it's much easier to do IPsec when you encrypt the GRE as opposed to trying to account for every TCP transaction that can happen. Um, and so we open up a GRE tunnel, and then you encrypt the tunnel, and life is good because your IPsec access list is very short and sweet. So when you start to tunnel traffic, what's the first thing that you have to worry about? MTU, MTU. MTU right? Makes sense. Because, um, and, and then over time, people started to come up with different ways to tackle this. It's actually kind of an interesting topic all by itself. Do you use IPMTU command? What are the ramifications of doing that? Right? And one of the reasons why I love Jasper's and, and Christian's session is that they don't stop with just, oh, okay, let's move on. They dig into, you know, the release notes, for example, that, <laughs> that I don't read. Um, and, and so, you know, that's what you kind of have to be. All the great troubleshooters are very annoying people because we always ask why, 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 why is that, All right? So um, IPMTU, what is the impact of that? Well, then you can cheat and uh, Cisco gave us a command called TCPMSS adjust, right? This is one case where a router has to reach into a packet and modify things. Philosophically, I'm kind of against it because routers should pass packets along. It shouldn't punt to CPU and check for MSS size, right? So philosophically, I'm kind of opposed to that. And I said, well, it's okay. We have path MTU. That's what its job is. So let's look at the first, uh, actually, let me give you the um, visual first. So we have up to 250 branches being terminated onto one WAN router. There's another sister router that looks just like this because every branch is dual homed to another data center that's in a different, um, but for this exercise, it doesn't really matter. So we have a, a virtual IP uh, and mainframe, um, and that mainframe at the bottom of that screen is responsible for updating 1,000 branches in one shot, okay? And it turns out mainframe um, mainframes can open up a lot of sessions and, and saturate the bandwidth. 
but it still has to go through WAN router number one, WAN router number two for another set of 200 or so branches, WAN router number three for another couple hundred branches that get terminated, etc. Okay. So for, for now, let's assume that we're single homed and uh, every traffic must go in and out through that WAN router. All right. And that WAN router, of course, has uh, redundant backbone connections. So maybe I should update the diagram, but it's not a single connection to the backbone. There's two connections to the backbone. Everything's redundant, okay? All right, any questions so far? The topology and the layout, okay? So like, I think it was at like 11 o'clock at night, bang, the mainframe starts updating every branch. And again, random failure, okay? So why is that? So we started to, let's take a look at the packet capture and see if we can figure it out. So the first one is, it's nice to have some baselines to compare it against. Um, and so the, uh, the virtual IP address is here, 1961.21.231. And here's a, a branch example of a non-IPsec. Because remember, we can't change 1,000 branches overnight. It's kind of a phase rollout. So let's first take a look at what a normal branch looks like traffic-wise. Okay, so we don't really need to worry about what, you know, the sequence numbers and all these columns for now. Uh, and in fact, in fact, let's do this. Okay, we'll use relative sequence numbers because it's not so important in this case. Mm -hmm. So what's the first thing that, um, and I gotta apply this, sorry. Okay, so as I scroll down, okay, what I'm looking for is what? IPMTU involves <laughs> what part of the field? What part of the packet? IPMTU's primarily concerned with what? Fixing what? I'm sorry? Length. Length, okay. So take a look at the length field, okay. You see that I have two here. One's called cumulative bytes, one's called length. And sure enough, we're using full size packets, right? 1460 and everything's fine. This is an example of a, a complete download. Make sense? All right, nothing too fancy there. Um, so, yes. Back in the capture, though, you've got two packets. One's, uh, what, 15, ah, I think, right? beautiful. So, pattern recognition is already starting. So, thank you very much. So, the question was um, why do we have two packets here? 15, 14, 641. And it repeats. Pattern recognition, very important. Everybody see this? Right? 15, 14, 641. 15, 14, 641. Why is that? Anybody know? Buffer size, Buffer size where? Oracle. It's called SDU, Session Data Unit Size. Okay, so it turns out that Oracle buffers how much data it wants to give to the network. In this particular case, the penalty is not so great. Why? Only because it turns out it's two packets. If Oracle's SDU size was such that it produced three packets at a time, you're in for a world of hurt, right? Because that third packet becomes an odd number packet and just Google for my SharkFest session called evil odd packets and you'll see why odd number of packets are horrible. Okay, um, So you'll see session called evil odd packets. So um, here the only penalty is that you sent the packet over without a full size frame. Okay, But in the big scheme of things it doesn't um, affect you that much. However, quick segue, if you're doing bulk copy or database replication it behooves you to change the SDU size to 32K, the biggest one that you can do in Oracle. Why? Because you don't want to replicate and have every other packet carry 33% of capacity, right? And by changing the SDU size to 32K, you're asking Oracle, give me, 32, give me a bulldozer full of dirt and I'll worry about moving it. Right now, because the SDU is 2K, uh, he's giving me a shovel full of dirt to move, okay? So think of it that way, is that when the application gives me a bulldozer full of dirt, I can move that however efficiently I want. And TCP does a very good job of it. But if I'm, my hands are tied because the application is giving me just a, a, a shovel full, uh, you know, bucket size full, then it doesn't matter how good of a transport I have, I still have to go back to the application and say, give me more, give me more, give me more, etc. okay? All right, any questions so far? And by the way, uh, notice here on the flag side that um, every small packet here 
uh, has the push bit. Okay? So when the push bits are involved, that's the buffer being flushed and application saying, when you're done with that, come back to me, I'll give you more. So that's a, a big clue as to what we call buffer tearing, right? The application trying to dictate how much data to send. Okay? Kind of a long-winded answer to <laughs> why is there two pack? Again, you have to ask yourself why, right? So that's the detailed answer. So let's take a look at a, a branch that is not working. Um, actually, I'm sorry, take that back. So this branch, in this capture time point, didn't fail. It worked. So let's take a look. Okay. Um, so as we go down, what do we notice? Again, we're concentrating on the length field. We don't really care about the data. We don't really care about retransmissions right now. We care about the length field. And what do we notice? It's a little different, same pattern. Little different, same pattern, right? The first packet got a little smaller, which means that it forced the second pa packet to get a little bigger. Right? Because I'm not carrying 1460 anymore. This is the IPsec. So the question is, well, that it was a question, yeah. This is an example of an IPsec enabled working branch. So now I have something to compare it against. Right? So anybody uh, have any questions so far? What's the difference? IPsec uses smaller MSS size. Makes perfect sense. Right? Okay. So now, let's take a look at an IPsec branch that is not working. Which I didn't put in here, did I? That's okay. So let me just put a note here. Update with IP. Dummy. Okay, so I'll, I'll make sure I... Uh, so I know what the IP is. Uh, there's a couple different ways to find it, but I do know it, so I'm going to type it in here. Um, Where's your capture taken? Um, so let's see if we can figure that out. Okay, so. Uh, the question was, thank you very much. See, thank you. The question was, where was the packet capture taken? And we'll see if we can figure that out. Okay. Um, so here's the branch that is not working. And I scroll down. Length is all over the place, yeah. right? Um, and I'm thinking I got the wrong IP address because I don't see. Oh, actually, I do see it. Okay, that's fine. Okay, let me just confirm. Give me a second. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's go down the uh, the packet trace file, and uh, let's see if we notice anything. What do we notice right there? I'm sorry? Yeah, we're trying to send full size packets. What's going to happen to the full size packets? Okay. Who said fragmentation? Okay. That is one answer. However, there's a setting in every TCP or IP that says don't fragment this. Okay. You do not want to cheat by stripping this off. Cisco gives us another option, right? Where you can strip this out so that the router can fragment it. Again, philosophical difference, I don't want my router fragmenting IP level packets. Bad things can happen, okay? And, and I don't need to get into it right now, but um, that's one way is, but every one of these packets have do not fragment bit, and I am not stripping this out at the router. So what's gonna happen to these packets? It's going to, it's going to black hole because router is going to get this packet and the router looks at the outgoing interface and says, okay, what's my MTU? Oh, it's smaller because I have IPsec GRE. So what should the router do? That's right. The router should send an ICMP message, specifically type 3 code 4, that says packet is too large. This is the MTU size that you should make it. So please make it smaller. Okay, and this is a feedback mechanism called path MTU discovery. That's exactly how it works. And we noticed that when we did TCP, let's do it here. 
we know when we do TCP analysis flags, and, and those of you that have attended my previous sessions, you know I always start with TCP analysis flags. We see retransmissions here. Okay, this is a retransmission, retransmissions, retransmissions out of order. So that should have kind of caught your attention. Like, hey, what's the deal with these retransmissions? Okay. So we'll see if we can figure that out. But we also noticed just by observing that the pattern of packets changed, didn't it? The top half is 1500, all of a sudden magically it's what? 1424 and smaller, right? So what's in the middle? What happened in the middle between the 1500 and 1400? You got the destination I'm sorry? One packet up, you got the destination unreachable. That's right. We have our magic bullet here where he says destination is unreachable. Okay? This is an ICMP message that says it's type 3 code 4. I can't get to the destination because fragmentation is needed and you have do not fragment bit set. So let's look inside and this is the part where Jasper's anonymization tool comes into play because I had to use a hex editor to modify this okay? <laughs> because the IP header is not the IP header it's an ICMP data portion and then I forgot which IP address I munged so initially my ICMP message didn't match my trace file right so anyway again these are the pain points that we go through so here's the original ICMP message with an original IP header 231 which is the database talking to a branch 152 and he says the next top MTU should be 1430 please so the router is telling you make your packet size smaller because my exit interface is too small who sent this packet? Okay, It's some random router along the path. Not only is it some random router along the path, it's the interface closer to the mainframe that will have the IP address. When Cisco sends an alert message, okay, you don't, they don't use loopback address. Okay? Cisco will craft the message by saying, who do I need to send this uh, ICMP message to? Over here, what's my closest exit interface? Oh, this one, I'll source the packet from there. Which makes it a challenge if you're filtering on ICMP message from your firewall. What are you going to do? Account for every single interface in your organization? Right? You can't do that. Right? In the immortal words of Honey Brown, Brown Honey, Honey Brown, nobody's got time for that. Right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea. But there's, that's why Google exists. Okay? <laughs> Right? Yeah. So, um, so um, if you're responsible for the firewall and you have some internal um, applications or in between businesses and whatnot, at the very least, open up ICMP Type 3 Code 4. Because you can't do that much damage with it, but it breaks path to you. Okay? But again, security will say, no, you can get DDoS, and, but it's internal network. If I'm going to DDoS you, I don't need. ICMP to do that, right? So again, char to Charles's speech this morning, right? Who enjoyed that, by the way? Was that not funny? I mean, just um, so anyway. Steve and Charles are both outstanding presenters. Uh, Steve Riley. Um, so again, you have to open up ICMP Type Three Code Four. So now I said, oh yeah, okay, this is exactly how it's supposed to work. The client, the mainframe, sent large packets. The router with IPsec enabled said, too big, make it smaller. And the mainframe said, okay, no problem. I'll create a host route, right? And that's how um, applications and TCP stacks do this, right? When you get an ICMP 3.4 message, you create a host routing table with MTU in there. That's how the, the server knows when I'm talking to this client, I better make the MTU size smaller. Okay, who knew that? I was curious one day, like, how does it know? Like, how does it know that when he gets an ICMP 3.4 message to make it smaller? Like, where does he keep that information? So I looked it up in the RFC, right? And when you get an ICMP Type 3 Code 4, you create a host entry in your routing table so you know what the, uh, next slide, yes. But is that server message host route only to the interface? That's right, it's a slash 32 route to the destination of the client, not the, the router. It knows that when I'm talking to that destination, did I repeat the question? No. no. All right, just keeping you on your toes. <laughs> uh, the question was, when the host route table is created, is it to the 
router that sent it the ICMP? And the answer is no, it's for the destination, final destination. Okay, it's a slash 32 route. All right, so nothing unusual here, correct? So why are the other branches failing? That's the question, isn't it? Okay, so unfortunately, um, due to my incompetence, I filtered out the IPsec branch that didn't work and continued not to work, but we already know what happens in that scenario, right? What might not make this branch work with IPsec example? I think I heard ICMP is not working, right? So the, right, so I said, oh, we're blocking ICMP. But then that didn't make sense because random branches are failing. I don't have a firewall. I don't have an access list. I, I checked, right? I logged into every one of these routers and checked. We don't have an access list. We don't have a firewall. Why the hell isn't it working? Okay. And then I remembered something that I read about a year ago from this problem. Okay. And um, by the way, who enjoyed Rich Seifert's uh, speech? Okay. So Rich and I got to know each other through Usenet. He happened to be great at anything Ethernet related, and he answered every one of my questions to the nth degree. And um, and I just you know uh, I, I followed that news group religiously, a couple of them. And uh, so when it came time to last year, you know Janice and I were talking. I said, Janice, I think I have a perfect guy that can talk for us. I shot him an email to his Usenet address, and luckily he he still monitored that and and got back to us. Okay, so in that forum. The, the not that news group, Comticom Lands Ethernet, there was another news group that I followed religiously, Comsys uh, Cisco, right? And uh, a guy named Aaron Leonard posted something that I kind of filed away. Cisco IOS has a rate limiting command by default on a per interface basis. This is to make sure that if you send it 50,000 1500 byte packets, that it doesn't send out 50,000 ICMP messages and, and basically die. So it will rate limit his ICMP type three code four to every two per half a second. I don't know why they don't do four per second. Or every packet, every ICMP message um, per half a second. So in other words, so let me, the Cisco document came that way. So, that, so it's either gonna be four ICMP messages per second or two ICMP messages per second. That's the default rate limiting built into iOS. Okay. So I said, aha, I think I know what the problem is. And we implemented a command called, uh, actually it's a, there's a takeaway sheet. So I got a, um, so in my presentation, uh, when you download it at the very end, there are some key concepts and takeaway points. Uh, uh, attendee last year made this recommendation. I thought it was a great idea. I don't know why I didn't do it before. So some of the commands that you might want to type is IPI CMP rate limit unreachable DF10. ASR routers have a corresponding uh, similar command, but it's very easy to find. And so this tells it that every 10 millisecond respond to uh, ICMP 3.4 requirements, okay? So why did it fail? Let's go back to, and let's think about why did random branches fail? Because a couple of things have to happen. Mainframes opens up a lot of connections very, very quickly, okay? If I happen to be hitting the first four branches on this router that you see here, those four guys are going to work. But the fifth guy is not going to get it because Cisco IOS quenches it and says, I'm not going to send you an ICMP 3.4 message because my rate li I've used up all my budget. Time elapses, the next set of branches, the next four, gets the ICMP message. But then the, f the ninth one doesn't get the ICMP message. This is why it was all over the map. But if the mainframe was busy and he delayed a connection by just a little bit, right, then five or six or seven branches worked, okay? And besides, you know, we weren't tracking failure of a branch based on numerical order. It's just random, right? So this is why it didn't work. Very simple problem, but only if you can tie those two things together. So as a troubleshooter, your job is to look for the most obvious problem first, Okay. And then if you're lucky, try to compare it with a working and non-working example. In this trace file, I told you, forget about the other columns for now. Why? Because PathMTU and IPsec, PathMTU, those are the warning signals. You should only care about the length column. 
And your brain is very, very good, exceptionally good, at picking up these patterns. Okay? Any questions so far on this one? Easy problem, but not if you have a thousand branches to sift through. Okay? It's only the scale that made it very difficult. Okay? Any other? Yes, we have a question. Okay, so the question was, um, were we ever tempted to modify the MSS or MTU size even uh, on the server to get around that? The answer is yes, but it's a mainframe. And, um, and here's the reason why I'm very hesitant about changing MTU sizes. I learned through the School of Hard Knocks that not every stack is as robust as it should. And if you go off the beaten path, you're going to be exposed to a bug that may only show up because you changed the MTU size. Why? Because, and, and this was certainly true when I was writing, you know, what I passable as code, was that um, I only worried about the biggest use case, right? I, I spent all my time optimizing the most common use case. And, and did I check every outer, and, and everybody saw, did uh, people see, how many here attended Steve Riley's session yesterday? No? Okay, so, you know, he showed a nice Venn diagram that says this is how the application react and this is how it really does in the real world and there's always this difference, right? So most c developers concentrate on the core use case and everything else is kind of like, hey, I'll get to it when I can. I'm not going to spend time optimizing it. I've seen this firsthand, so my first reaction is let's do it right, right? Let's not leave a ticking time bomb for the next poor bastard that has to troubleshoot this. Because what if... What if the mainframe, right, um, does an IPL? How many of you know what that is? <laughs> you don't know, right? No, you don't know. I can tell by your age. But. So <laughs> when you IPL, a bend, anybody here remember from Novella it abended, right? That's an abnormal end, right? All mainframes speak. IPL is initial program load, I think. Basically control, delete for the mainframe. What if you do that and that MTU setting doesn't stick? So now I just created uh, a ticking time bomb uh, for someone else, okay? So I wanted to fix it the right way, okay? but I was tempted. Once I figured it out though, it was easy, right? Just rate lim un unrate limit the ICMP, life is good. All right, any questions on this one? Okay, perfect. So this next one is actually, was going to be my deep dive. Uh, and then I did two scenarios from the deep dive, ran out of time, and this one is worthy. This is very interesting trace. Here's a, it's a retail branch, a retail um, customer uh, doing SSH and SCP, secure copy. In one direction, they get, what, 10 plus megabits per second throughput. You go the other direction, and it's three megabits per second or less. So there's a directionality to this problem. I like those because it completely removes the problem domain or reduces the problem domain in half. I don't have to worry about stuff going that way because it's doing well. I only have to worry about stuff going this way, right? So my job is already cut down in half. So I, I kind of like that. Um, and when I was presented with this case by our, one of our SCs, I gave him the answer right away. And and he thought, it was like, how did you do that from the trace file? It, it wasn't from the trace file, it was from experience. I've seen this before, okay? So now I want to show you this because a lot of you use OpenSSH to do file transfers, right? Your application folks are using OpenSSH to do file transfer, all right? Um, so let's talk about what do you rule out immediately when it's a throughput issue? Thank you. It's actually the bane of my, almost the, no longer the bane of my existence, but it was. And duplex mismatch was very, very common. Okay? But duplex mismatches are pretty easy to find too, because you're going to have consistent errors. Okay? Right? Okay? So duplex mismatch, rule that out. What else? Overload of? Okay. So you check the congestion rate. Um, and if the circuit is congested, what are some of the clues as to um, whether the circuit is congested or not? Drops, packet loss. What else? In the back there? Okay, so you might see an upper limit of some sort. 
because somebody is governing that transfer. What else? Retransmissions, because it's packet loss, yep. There's something else too that can be very helpful. What type of delays happen when, um, when there's congestion? Queuing, right? How long does it take to go from one side of the circuit to the other side? That's the speed of light, right? It doesn't change. Okay. Okay, so your round trip time will wander. Okay, you'll have jitter. Why? Because you get queuing delay. Okay, so once you get on the circuit, it takes the exact same amount of time to get to the other side because it's clocked. Okay, how long does it take for a 1500 byte packet to traverse a T1? Anybody know? Simple math, it's about eight milliseconds. So if you see packets coming in every milliseconds, that's just serialization delay. Okay, that's how long it takes for packets to jump on the wire and get to the other side. Simple math, right? One and a half megabits per second, 1500 bytes, do the math, comes out to about eight milliseconds, I think. So when you see that number go up and down, eight milliseconds, uh, and you can see this with just ping. Pick a target and just start pinging nonstop. And you'll see that the ping times j go all over the map. Why? Because sometimes you get stuck behind a large size frame and you have to wait for him to clear the circuit before you get on. Sometimes you get stuck behind two packets, which means you jump on right away. Okay? So when you see a large jitter, it could be indication that there's congestion. Okay? What else do you rule out? The first and the foremost thing you rule out when you have a throughput issue. Number one thing you should look at. Okay, odd number packets, right? What else? But even more fundamental than that. Window size. TCP cannot, and in the Asper session you saw that, right? When, you, you, when your send buffer is full, you can't transmit anymore. Okay, so for those of you that were not at my Sunday session, I'll just repeat this because it, I think it's worth um, repeating because it's very fundamental to troubleshooting. TCP, when it sends, has to make a copy of the packet or the data and put it into a warehouse. Why? Because if that data gets lost, TCP has to go into the warehouse, find that stream of data, put it back in the wire, and send it out. That's how TCP retransmits. So if that buffer in the warehouse is full, you have to tell the application, now sorry, that's it, I can't transmit anymore. I don't have any more room in my warehouse that I need to keep just in case I drop packets. UDP doesn't have this warehouse concept. That's why it's spray and pray, okay? I'll send it out as fast as I can because I'm not the one responsible for retransmitting. You, Mr. Application, you have to do that, okay? But TCP guarantees delivery by having this warehouse set aside. So when the warehouse is full, I can't transmit anymore. Simple as that. So that's why window size matters. Receiver window size, same thing, right? You have to queue up bytes, and when the receiver window size is full, you get a zero window. That's, so zero window means my, uh, my receive buffer is full, and TCP window size full means I can't send any more data. That's a transmitter fault. Okay, zero window, receiver fault. Window full, that's transmitter fault. Okay? All right, so um, we also want to look for push bits. Why? Because every time a push bit is set, application is flushing the buffer and is trying to dictate how much TCP can send to the other side. Right? Does everybody get that? So when you have 1,500 bytes to, uh, let's say, let's use a, 2,000 bytes. I need to say this Word document is 2,000 byte file. Um, window or Word, for example, might give you 1,000 bytes and then flush it. And then the last packet of that 1,000 byte um, will have a push bit set. Okay, horrible example because it's 1,000 bytes in one packet. So let's say it's 10,000 bytes. So the, you, you need to send 5,000 bytes, you flush the buffer, then the first packet, second packet, third, fourth, fifth, sixth packet, whatever that number comes out to be, we'll have a push bit set. Push bit means I'm the last guy getting on the train, let's see if we can go. Okay, that's what the push bit means. Uh, and then on the receiver, you try to send it up to the application as quickly as possible. Everybody, um, no questions so far? I know I'm talking really, really fast, but I'm trying to, um, trying to uh, fit all of this in. Okay. Oh, by the way, one thing you might notice, Jasper, I was kind of chuckling because Jasper and I um, work so uh, similarly. 
Um, notice my packet capture files have names like chopped, right? Um, I know that, that I edit kept it, okay? Because then I know I sanitized it. So without even knowing that, my naming convention says it's chopped, okay? Um, so why do I do this? Because you need to come up with one common naming standard. So when you have 540 packet trace files that you need to analyze later, the name alone can clue you in to whether you deduped it, whether it's edit capped, right? Because if it's chopped, you know that you did it. But if it doesn't say chopped and the packet sizes are small, then you didn't do that, right? That doesn't become part of your troubleshooting, right? So again, come up with the naming convention so that... Um, all right, so um, first thing I do normally is I do TCP analysis.flags. And sure enough, uh, there's a bunch of packet loss here. Okay, so we see here previous segment lost, and then we see the classic um, duplicate act behavior. One, two, three, four, five, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, et cetera. Why do we have so many duplicate acts? Who can answer that question? One packet gets lost here, then this guy says, notice the act number stays the same, saying, hey, I'm missing this chunk, and it's, he sends, what, 20, 22 of them? Why is there so many duplicate acts? What's the deal with that? Network's buffering it. Network is buffering it. That's one answer, possibly. What else? Who's responsible for sending duplicate acts? The receiver. The receiver is telling the sender, I missed this chunk. Resend it, please. So why do I have 22 of them, 23 of them? And look at the timestamp. Look how fast they're coming. Is it the same packet? That's one possible thing you have to rule out. Make sure it's not a redundant, uh, uh, right? But then I don't see all that. Remember when Jasper's session, he showed it to you too, right? If I, if, I'm, if I have duplicate packets, I should see retransmission every other packet. And yet I don't. It's just these are duplicate acts coming. Why? Selective acknowledgement? Maybe, not quite. Okay. So when you're troubleshooting, it helps to become... Um, um, I just blanked on the movie name. Uh, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, Gopher, Golf. Caddyshack. Caddyshack. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I haven't gotten much sleep lately, right? You got to do that. Da -na 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 -na. Be the ball, right? Be the packet. Be the TCP stack. You think I'm joking. I'm not. These problems can be solved if you visualize it, okay? Did you know? I'm watching Brain Games. Uh, like I, I mentioned on Sunday, best show ever. National Geographic Brain Games, you must watch it. It will make you a better troubleshooter because you'll know when your brain is lying to you. At least you'll be aware of it, okay? It's a fascinating show. And, um, and, and so when you ask somebody, hey, what does this sh picture look like? It's some random picture and most adults answer, uh, it looks like a hot dog bun, a burger, whatever, right? So whatever, and then t after two or three, they stop. You ask a seven-year-old child, what does this look like? And they'll say, they'll rattle off eight, nine, ten things in a row, okay? Because their brain is much more flexible. Their pathways are more, and they can come up with more creative answer. So then the guy did an experiment and said, hey, I want you to think like a child when I ask you this question. What does this shape look like? And lo and behold, most people started rattling off five or six answers just by prepping them by saying, Think like a child, and that tells your brain to turn off some social stuff that we learned as adults. It's as simple as that, okay? And then they, I don't want to be a National Geographic commercial, but they show you a picture of a school bus, nondescript school bus, and they ask an adult, which way is a bus going to go forward? And you look at the picture, and it's just, it's identical front and back, and most adults are like, I don't know, left, right, 50-50 shot at getting right. You ask children, and almost every one of them will tell you it's going to go left. Without fail, most kids give you the answer, and the correct answer, immediately. Why? Because they get on school buses all the time, and they realize they don't see the school bus door. But they see, right? So by saying, oh, the school bus door must be over here, that means it's got to go this way. Okay? So again, you know, this is how, what our brain does. So why am I talking about this? Let's be the TCP stack. Let's be the sender, okay? What's my limiting governor governing factor in terms of transmission? Window. window size. I have this big window size. Let's call it 
two meg window size. How much packet, how many packets can I send out on the wire? A lot. A lot. That's right, because the train, the packet train, has left the station, ladies and gentlemen. So 50 packets left in one shot, microseconds apart. So what if that 10th packet gets lost? So now, be the receiver, okay? That, exactly. So you signify that, hey, I lost packet number 12, thank you very much, but you sent me 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20. every one of those will generate two packs. Very common in high-speed modern network, okay? So there's actually one corner case here that's extremely difficult to analyze, but I'm not gonna get into that because it's such a pain and I haven't figured it out yet. There's no TCP documentation that covers this corner case, okay? And it seems like every vendor does it slightly differently. So I may nail it down and present next year, but if you're curious, email me and I'll explain to you what it is. But it's, it's uh, very much a corner case, all right? So, we notice that there's a packet loss. Now we know that this looks really horrible, but makes perfect sense. Okay, all these packet trains left. And so uh, if packet number 10 is missing and you have sent 50 trains, you're gonna get 40 dupe backs. Simple as that, okay? And the really, really hard part is, at what point do you stop trusting that these are real dupe backs? Because what if your retransmission got lost again? What do you do then? So anyway, that's the, that's the corner case that's very, very interesting, uh, thought-provoking. Keeps me up at night and go, hmm. Okay. So anyway, so, yeah, besides, while I'm drinking my scotch. Is this after the scotch? I'm sorry? Is this after the scotch? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. I'm drinking my scotch, drinking my coffee. So I'm going to do the analysis here. So this is... Um, why am I starting at this packet? Because uh, I have a little cheat sheet here, but it doesn't matter. This repeats over and over. Um, and so notice here that this guy is a 10. He's sending all the data. And what does he have right there? Push bit. So we can reasonably conclude that this guy flushed his, right, gave me the bulldozer full of data. And now it's up to TCP to say, yep, I'm good to go. Let's start on the next bucket of data. So that's why I picked this packet. Round trip time is about 50 milliseconds, okay? So let's look at the delta right here. Oh, wait a minute. Um, there it is, okay. So I'm looking here to here, I'm getting confused. So there's a 50 second delta because it's a round trip time. So let's say this is Big Bang, start of creation, and I'm gonna do a time reference, control T. Control T is your friend, okay? So I'm going to set the time reference. And uh, let's go down here. And look at packet 1486. What's the delta between 40, 85 and 86? At the very bottom there. So let me scroll up so some of you in the back can see it. 50 milliseconds. Why is that delta there? Is it a buffer flush? No, probably not, because if it was buffer flush, what would packet number, uh, it's very disorienting looking, uh, packet number 1485, what would he have? Oh, he does have a push bit. Oh, he does? He does? No, he doesn't. Attention to detail, people. Who, who sent that packet? Right. Did the sender have a push bit? No. So I'll ask you again. Why do we have a 50 millisecond delay when this guy, which is the last of the packet train that left the station, doesn't have a push bit? It's not a window size limitation because if it was a window size limitation, we would have seen window size is full or zero window size. Okay. So why did he stop right there and said, I'm gonna wait for a round trip time. Why did he do that? Odd number, is that four, because it's odd number? Okay, so, okay, so here we have three packets, but let's do the analysis here on this guy. Which one is he acknowledging? 
he's actually acknowledging packet 1479. I have a column here called Act 4, meaning he acknowledged 79, he acknowledged 1481, which means we're up to here, okay? So is that the reason why we have this delay? And what happens just before this delay, round trip delay here? What did the, the client do? He sent an application level message, didn't he? We know that because his flag is set to 18, right? Everybody see that? The 192.168 client sent some message, and he, 48 bytes to be exact, and he flushed it, said, this is my, um, maybe he's saying, give me the next chunk, could be, we don't know, it's encrypted, right? Okay, so I want you to kind of think about that, and let's go, keep going down to, so this is my new time reference, so this is my new time beginning Big Bang, and we go all the way to, where am I, 1486? Um, so let's go all the way to 1515. This is like the cooking class where I don't have time to show you everything, so we're going to jump there, and um, we have a long delay here again. So we have a same behavior where all of a sudden the 10 dot guy stops transmitting without the push bit, but the client has an act with some kind of push. He has a push bit, 18 right there. So now this has happened to us twice. We sent some amount of data. We stopped. The application on the other side gave us some kind of a response, and then we kept going, right? Okay. So this happens again. So now I'm going to go to here. And the part that's kind of confusing here is if this packet here had a push bit, <coughs> slam dunk, case closed, application is only giving me the, uh, where I marked it time reference to here, and now the application is dictating how much I can send. But that's not the case here. I don't have a push bit at the end of my packet train on where that packet is highlighted. Okay. So let's go to my next chunk. And we're going to go to 1547, I think. Okay, so the, the question is, could you modulate this by not with a push bit, but some kind of an application level message, right? The, um, and, and that's absolutely, maybe, possibly, right? We don't know because it's encrypted. We can only gather circumstantial evidence and then figure out what might be causing this, right? So keep that in mind. And so here we're looking at packet number 1547. And um, here's a delay here. And it's the same behavior, okay? This guy doesn't have a push bit. He stopped. But then look what happens here. So all the other time, we jumped about, I don't know, um, 30, 40 packets at a time, right? But this time, just a few more packets later, I have another 51 millisecond delta, okay? And why is that? Why is this one significant? Why is there a 50 millisecond delta right where I have my cursor? How is this one different? Number one, it's different because we don't have 30 packets, okay? It's just a couple packets up is where that mysterious delay occurred. But you do have a push bit from the transmitter. But we have a push bit set, okay? Notice this guy, oh, sorry. This is really confusing for me. Um, notice this guy has a push bit. So how much did I... So then I got to thinking, I went through this a couple more times, and this pattern repeats itself again and again and again, okay? Seems like three big chunks uh, of data, and then little straggler here, five, six packets of data being sent with a push bit set, that 406 byte, okay? Which in TCP world is 348 minus the header, but anyway, here's a small packet. So let's go back to the beginning where we started our, and go back a few packets. Notice that this is where we started. This guy, the last packet train, also had the push bit and it was also small. So now we have pretty good evidence that this in fact is the end of the packet train and it just has few little bytes that the application has left over. OK? 
Okay? So how much data are we sending push bit to push bit? It's actually pretty easy to calculate that because I learned something today. And that is, is it here? Um, on time reference all packets. Okay? I did not know this option existed. And if you watch brain games, you'll know why this line was completely invisible to me, because my brain lies to me. I only care about what I care about. Everything else is just blurry garbage. That's how your brain works, believe it or not. Okay? So I only care about certain things in this menu. Never paid attention to uh, untime all packets. You know how I did it? I did it by doing TCP analysis.flags, because I know all my time references are in there. And then I would go find them and undo them here. Okay, kind of stupid. I feel kind of silly, but that's my workflow. Okay, so now I do, but I know now that I can go to edit untime reference all my packets. And let's go back to 1454. Uh, start of my Big Bang right here, Control T. Now what do I do? I can go to my next push, can't I? Right? Push to push. How much data am I sending? And I'm going to go to. Uh, 1553, there it is, okay? About 113K with headers, okay? I can add tcp.length as a column, but I can't add it, so, uh, but roughly about 110K of data got sent. This, yes? So did that change a human's bytes to zero? Uh, so when you set the time reference, it starts new counter from that point on, so, um, so that's why I say it's a big bang, it's the beginning of time, and all the cumulative bytes, f in fact, I'll show it to you. If I set my time reference to be here, notice these numbers down here will instantly go to zero and start over. That's why time reference is a very, very useful feature. So you'll see this pattern again happen 130K, 130K, and 130K, and I said, there's got to be a reason for this. This can't happen all the time. So what are some of the things that we noticed? There are chunks of data, okay, we have one one, two, three, okay, with 30 or 40 packets, and then the last one has five or six packets. That pattern repeats itself again and again. So I did some math. I said, how much do we have where we have this mysterious delay of 50 milliseconds? How much data was being transferred? Came out to about 32K-ish. And those are boundary numbers that we should all be aware of, okay? Most numbers don't end up nicely like 32K, 120K, right? So I said, the application must be doing something here. So I started researching. I happened to talk to uh, a very, very squared away administrator, an application guy and a programmer. And uh, I described him the behavior and he goes, you know, he goes, I think I know why. I said, why, tell me. And he said, OpenSSH has this concept of, because I was telling him about how the application buffer tearing and all of that, and, and you know, I, I, I can recognize that because the push bit at the end of the packet train. Um, but here, I, I had this stop in the middle for some reason, and I wanted, and, and it doesn't have a push bit, so I was kind of at a loss initially as to why that was the case. But then he told me that, you know what, OpenSSH defaults to uh, how much you can send called channel session window default. This is in the channels.h header file, okay? And, uh, and it's every OpenSSH to a certain version has this. Starting with version 5.9, they patched it and said, you know what, let's not do four times the session packet default. Let's go to something bigger. And so what basically what you're seeing here is that it's four times ch channel session packet default, where the ch channel session packet default is about 32 times 1024. In other words, you're allowed to send 32K chunks of data but four of them, okay? In this case, the application doesn't flush in between these little mini buffers, right? He says, what's my ch channel session packet default? 32K, okay, I'll send that, but I'm allowed to send four. So I'll wait for the round trip acknowledgement from the other side to come back to me. That's one round trip, that's the 50 millisecond delay. So if you do the download this trace file and go through it, you'll see that I sent the 32K, I need an application level message before I continue, okay? And that application message takes 50 milliseconds because by the time I send the packet and he receives it, that acknowledgement takes round trip time to get back to me, okay?
Okay, so the gentleman over here was absolutely correct. The gating factor here wasn't the flushing of the buffer. The gating factor here was the application on the other side said, I got the f channel session default of 32K, give me the next one. And OpenSSH does four at a time. Okay. So why was it faster the other way around? I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. They updated the OpenSSH. Okay, simple as that. Okay, as simple as that. So, any questions on this one? This was interesting because I thought, you know, oh, I know what the question is, right? And I answer it. Did you know that Brain Games has an answer to that as well? <laughs> it's fascinating. I'll, and, I'll, and I'll give you the, uh, I'll give you a question. Okay, how many pairs of animals did Moses take on the ark? Yeah. Most people will say one pair of animals. Right? And then I say, no, it's not. And then people look at me, what? Of course it's one pair. He didn't take two pairs of, you know. But the question was, who said that? Over here, somebody heard it, right? The question was, how many pairs of animal did Moses take on the ark? Moses didn't take the ark. It was Noah. But why did we jump to the answer? Because our brain... So, tries to be as efficient as possible, takes a couple of keywords, and you jump to a conclusion. Okay? Our brain is wired to do this. So when you're doing protocol analysis, you need to stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> okay? So I bring that analogy up because I want you to stop, drop, and roll. Yes, first session was all about false positive. Okay? It only takes one time to you running off to your boss and say, I found the problem. It's this. Oh, crap, that's not the problem. It was a false positive. We've all done it. So when you think you found the problem, stop, drop, and roll. Look at it five different ways and make sure your stuff is good to go before you write a report. Okay? Any questions on that one? Yes, question in the back. So was this SCP or SCP? SCP, secure copy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was faster in the other direction because other guy's channel window size was increased from um, 4 to, what did my document say, 64. Okay, so you, no, what, what you saw was 64 chunks of data being transferred as opposed to 3 and then the little straggler. When you have a large file to transmit, each one of those uh, takes a long time. Okay, those round trips starts to add up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 50 milliseconds is a long time. Right? To a network guy, 50 milliseconds is a long, long time. Okay? Any questions on that one? How much time do I have? 15 minutes? Crap. Take all the time you need. <laughs> okay, this one. This one's interesting. This one will be fast. So uh, I got a call from uh, one of our SCs doing a proof of concept. And boy, our, our uh, outstanding reporting engine called Profiler um, and the outstanding packet capture agent called Shark. Um, you're seeing these UDP zero messages, right? And uh, he said, what are these, who uses UDP zero? What's UDP port or TCP port zero reserved for? Anybody know? So, this is where I go to my, my one of my favorite sites called, let me Google that for you. <laughs> um, Okay, so you can now copy this URL and send it to somebody. And it says, let me Google that for you. <laughs> Was that so hard? Okay, a lot of questions can be answered by Google. And P I, I'm astounded, and, I, and I, that's why I was laughing when Charles showed the laziness, right? The fitness center with an escalator, the toilet paper on top of the roll, doorstop, using as a doorstop, but didn't open the packaging, right? People are inherently lazy, and I get these kinds of questions. It annoys the hell out of me, because, and I often respond, if it's a friend of mine, Google's down for you, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, it's uh, in the INA, the Assigned Numbers uh, Authority, it's reserved, it says it's reserved. So you shouldn't be using zero. So let's look at the packet trace and see why something jumped out at me. 
So now that it's TCP uh, UDP packets, I don't need to look at all this next sequence number. So let's go to my UDP. Okay. And um, so the first thing we notice here is this is quick. And the brain games, remember, stop, drop, and roll. Don't go running off to your boss and say, they're playing quick. <laughs> okay? That's not it. Stop, drop, and roll. Okay? Exactly. That's exactly right. Turn it off. Like Jasper said, if you need Wireshark to tell you that port 80 is HTTP, you probably ought not be doing this. Okay? So we can go to uh, the protocol preference and, um, oh, is that here? Well, anyway, I can turn that off in edit preferences. Um, so that's not it. But what else catches your eye about this packet trace? What makes you go, hmm, that's interesting? Link. It's identical. What protocol do you know uses UDP that have pretty uniform size packets? Someone just went like this, right? The universal sign for call me, right? So I said, could this be voice? Could it? How long would it take me to find out? About as long as for me to say, analyze, decode as RTP. Now, it looks more interesting because I see PACM U law, right? Um, G711 <coughs> seems to be okay, right? Seems like it's a voice, but it's using port zero. Why is that? Okay. So then I say, well, if it's voice, what would I be able to do? I can go to telephony, RTP, and uh, stream analysis. Okay. Actually, before I do that, let's just make sure. How many are there? There's six of them. Okay. Um, so why do I do this? Because I'm looking at something that's interesting, right? People with bytes. I don't care if it's one or two bytes. So this one has bytes. So I say selected A and B. So this one's interesting to me. And then we right click, oh, I'm sorry, go to uh, statistic, uh, telephony. Just because I'm turning left, my brain stops working. Um, we go to RTP, um, stream analysis. Oops, sorry. Why? Because I forgot to, once you do a display filter, you got to do a decode as again. And let's go to telephony, stream analysis. Again, I have no idea if this is voice or not, but it's going to take me 30 seconds to find out. Okay. So, let me see if I can do... Oh, it might play. I don't know. So let's see. Try that again. You guys can't hear that, right? Yeah, it's what it's playing is hold music. Da 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 da. Which microphone? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so it was, it was, it's play, if, if I uh, replay this, uh, my, my speaker's not as... But anyway, it's playing hold music. So I said, oh, this is hold music. And then they asked me the obvious question. Why would it be using UDP port zero? I said, I don't know. And this turns out to be a legacy PBX uh, using, um, you know, different ways of getting legacy PBX onto the network and happened to be using UDP port zero, okay? Playing hold music all day, every day, okay? <laughs> because you don't know what you don't know. Until you got a visibility solution that said, what do you think this might be? Who's got time for that, right? Again, Honey Brown scenario. I don't have time to be looking at UDP packets until someone pointed it out, okay? and that's what happened here, okay? So again, the moral of the story here is that if you know something somewhat about UDP and VoIP, you can kind of start to recognize these patterns. And you're thinking to yourself, how the hell am I going to know all these things? Practice. Just do a packet capture every chance you get, and it builds up your beta database of knowledge about protocol analysis. Okay? It's like when you study for CCIE. The first time you do it, it's, uh, it's just overwhelming because there's so much information that you have to learn. But then that's true for any profession, right? Whether you're doing um, statics or you're doing strength of materials, fluid analysis, uh, whatever that course in your profession is, it's an overwhelming amount of data that you have to be well-versed in. 
protocol analysis is no different. Okay, Wireshark, as good as it is, will not, there is no easy button for Wireshark. There just isn't. Okay? So you have to be the, the brains behind the scenes and figure this stuff out. Any questions on this one? Okay, so let's go to the, I got five minutes, perfect. It's not perfect because this one is somewhat more complicated. Um, I don't want to do it just injustice, but I'll quickly. So uh, one of my favorite, I get to use my line from uh, one of my favorite movies. Um, anybody watch Princess Bride? Yeah. And it says, what's happened since I've been out? Well, let me explain. No, there's no time. Let me summarize. Okay, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> homepage for 20,000 users. This is a homepage. When you bring up your browser, you're forced. You can't change it. It's, you can't even say use blank, right? I always say use blank. Um, you can't even do that. So these financial consultants, every one of them, 20,000, when they open up their browser, they go to this homepage. All of a sudden, Monday, of course it's Monday, um, things start to go wrong. Very wrong, in fact. 13, 15 seconds, sometimes it's really fast. The guy right next to you, really, really fast. You're stuck. Report, help desk is lit up. Every user across 20,000, you know, however many, 790 branches or so, are being impacted by this, okay? It's all hands on deck time. Because if financial consultants can't get to work, they lose money. Sometimes maybe they save money. <laughs> so, but I couldn't use that argument to my boss, right? I'm saving you money. Um, so, the question is, how do I even begin to attack a problem that impacts 20,000 users across the entire US geography, across 24, 48 routers, right? Where do I even begin? Where would you start tackling this problem at? Server might be good, but I got slow balanced. I got about eight of them, I think. Load balancer. Load balancer. The way you attack a problem is divide and conquer, but be a little smart about where you start to divide. Okay, this is binary sort. No matter the infrastructure size, when you start doing dividing and conquering, where you're chopping your problem in half, do I have a problem on the right side? No, nope. okay, it must be left side. So that's a binary search, and even though you have a huge infrastructure, you can quickly, in four, five, or six steps, find the problem, okay, or at least help you get there. So the first thing we said, oh, maybe it's a load balancer. So went on the change control system and said, was there a change done on the load balancer? And lo and behold, yes, there was a code patch upgrade. No coincidence in his life. So we started investigating. Okay? We were lucky that we had packet capture agents on the client side that we can get. And we had at the head end. And then um, we didn't have anything behind the load balancer. Uh, but I said, well, let's get started and see what we can see. Um, and this is what the trace looked like. Okay? Um, I need my cheat sheet. So. So, let's take a look at this trace file very, very quickly. Again, I don't want to rush it too much, but, okay. So there's one here. He seems to be doing all right. Stuff happening here. My delta, right? Not too bad. No, there's, every once in a while there's, right? But this is normal, why? Right? SSL. SSL has a lot of back and forth cipher, right? So don't worry about SSL handshake, okay? Drop, stop, and roll. This is not your problem, okay? Keep going, okay? Um, then we see some full-size packets. Here we have 54 millisecond for an acknowledgement, okay? So we'll start looking at it. Um, seems to be okay, right? Anything wrong here? That anything jump out? Not really, right? <coughs> if I'm a performance engineering and this was known bad things, I might start to look at this delta of 350, realize that, that could be SSL. So, but right now, it's crisis situation, right? Triage quickly and move on. Okay, let's find one that's having a problem. So we said, all right, help desk, give me a client that's having a problem right now, that had the problem in the last few minutes. Sorry. I'm sorry? Oh. We didn't document that, sorry. Oh. But that's okay, because I have a packet sniffer that's catching everybody, which apparently is not here. Okay, 
This one, not doing so well. Immediately, what do we see? Reset. Okay. And then what does Wireshark say over here? Where's the Synac? Right? I see the Syn. Where's the Synac? Stop, drop, and roll. There it is. Okay. Well, we can't see it. Sorry. Where's my sin? Uh, there's uh, sin, right? Sin, Synac. Okay. And then Wireshark says, wait a minute, TCP Act Unseen Segment. What's that about? Okay. So let me give you a helpful hint. When you're troubleshooting load balancer issues, do not, do not use relative sequence numbers. Why should you not use relative sequence numbers? Because relative sequence number starts by using zero for a beginning of every conversation, which means every user will have a relative sequence number of zero. Okay? But load balancer's job is to handle thousands of users and talk to the server on the back end. Right? So I can't magically replace all that sequence number with just zero. It doesn't, your analysis will not work. So let's go back to our default real sequence number. Okay? And apply the thing again. And we see sin. Where's my sin act? Okay. Uh, there's my act. Reset, reset. What is this going on here? Why, why am I seeing a reset here? Okay. So there's my sin. This one has ACK reset. Okay. I sent the sin, and what happened? So let's follow this through. I sent the sin with my initial sequence number of this guy, and what does he send me? ACK, right? So you're thinking, I sent you a sin, and you're ACKing me, but maybe this was in flight. Could be, right? Because what's my round trip time? About 50 milliseconds or so, okay? So depending on where I captured it, right? This is impossible scenario, because you could not have possibly acknowledged me to my sin, because I didn't have enough time to get to the other side. But if I'm closer to the load balancer, yeah, this is reasonable. I re I, somebody, the client sent me the SIN, I captured it, I'm right next to the load balancer, and he gave me an answer back, so that timing is very, very small. Okay? But then I noticed that I get a reset from the client. I'm sorry, from the, uh, yeah, the client. Why is he sending me a reset? Why is he resetting that? Okay? I'm sorry? State machine violation. You don't get an act for a SIN. Okay. State machine violation. All right, I'll buy that. What else? So let's go back to here and look at the sin. Okay. Um, the other thing that kind of caught my eye right away was what's this act number start with? Beginning of the, the, the act number right there. What is he? Four something, right? What was my sin? Two something. I don't even care the rest of the number. I'm off by what? Billion? Two billion? Okay. So why would load balancer, to cut to the chase, right? Why would load balancer give me this packet if in fact it was a response to my sin with some act number that's way off? Non-persistence. Persistence or non-persistence, maybe? Not a response to your sin. It's not a response to It's not a response to my sin. That's another logical answer. Okay. Since we're short on time, I'm going to give you this picture. What we derived, and you can download this packet capture and go through this analysis on your own. This was happening, okay? So let's follow this through. Very quickly, we were able to put this together. And I must say, this is the one and only time I yelled at the vendor because he said, this is not a load balancer problem and will not escalate the ticket. And my response was, if you don't know what the hell you're doing, get off the call and get me somebody who does. Because I got 22,000 users that are impacted. And I have evidence to prove that it's in fact the load balancer. You're too stupid to know that, so get me somebody who can. Okay? Again, I wasn't mean about it. I kind of was mean about it. But it annoyed me because I, I, I ex patiently explained this, and yet he was rebuffing me with nothing. Right? At least come with me with something, right? But anyway, so 
This is exactly what was happening. Here's my load balancer. 102 is the client. The front end, the VIP, is 1010. The SNAT, the source NAT, is 2020. Okay? Can't imagine how painful this one was to scrub. And the server here is 170 to 16, 254, 254. I made these numbers so that it kind of jumps out at you. So just concentrate. 254, 254 is a server. 1010 10 front end, 2020 SNAT, and 10, uh, 102, 111 here is in the client. So when I send the initial uh, information with the source port and destination of 443, the load balancer, of course, intercepts that and uses a source NATing and says, I'll put 2020 here, and I'll put the source port of 3503 and send it to the server. Okay? Now look what happens when this guy in another branch sends the message. Some random source IP going to the same ephemeral source port of 3503. So the load balancer says, no problem, I'll take your connection, snat it with 20.20, .20, put it on 3503 port source port and the destination port 443. Now, -na 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 -na, be the server. <laughs> what just happened to your conversation? You're happy. It thinks, the two people are the same conversation. it thinks the two people are the same conversation, but what's going to be wildly different about these two conversations? Initial sequence numbers, way off, because it's random. Okay? So why did two clients use the same source port number? The range in the original days of Windows was pretty small, right? Jasper talked about it this morning, like 2,000 to 5,000, I think. Okay? That's 5,000 random port numbers that I can use. I have 22,000 users going to a home page, which means if, you know, imagine 22,000 users walking in around 8 o'clock-ish, and they're all opening and booting their windows, right? Chances of a collision in terms of source port number, very, very high, okay? So how do we catch this? How do we do it? Because I looked at the packet capture on the back-end side, and I looked at... Um, TCP handshake analysis okay. and in my takeaway sheet I didn't put it there but I will <coughs> Me. Okay. and what you'll notice is that when you look at it from a handshake standpoint this is a teardown that looks okay. That's fine. It's just normal sin, fin, 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 type stuff. And then here is my first clue. Wireshark is telling me, hey, you already used this port number and you're using it again. And what does a server do when they close out a connection? They go to what state? What am I talking about when I say what state is the server in? So TCP state. Okay, you have to know that. You have to know this to be true troubleshooter. When can I use a port number? When can I not reuse a port number? And it's called state diagram for TCP, okay? And, uh, and what you'll see here is the guy says, uh -uh, sorry, I was talking to you on two billion something sequence number. All of a sudden you go to four billion or whatever that number is. I'm going to reset the connection. And then he's happy, right? There's send, send, act, and it goes on, okay? Because reset is a what? Click, hang up, okay? Start over, okay? So this was happening again and again and again. Um, it actually doesn't take you very long to find this problem. Oh, sorry. I got the da -da 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 um, speech. So I'm sorry, Steve. Um, and so when you look at it, you just have to do it under pressure. You have to know what you're looking for, and uh, it's easy to do. And you'll be able to download this uh, recording from the YouTube and, and when Janice posts this presentation. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.